Hey guys, welcome back to Career Day. One thing we do with the Lindsey Vaughn Foundation is we have sports scholarships and educational-based programs. And we've normally had a lot of athletes on the program, but today we have a very, very special scientist. She is a cognitive neuroscientist, a graduate of both Oxford and Harvard University. She's won prestigious awards such as the Young Investigator Award and the Clifton New York Prize. She's a television series called Science Goes to the Movies and Discovery Channel series called Superhuman Showdown. She's passionate about science, communication, and promoting STEM, which Lindsey Vaughn Foundation also does. We are pleased to welcome to the show, Dr. Heather Berlin. I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. How are things in uh, New York? Pretty crazy still, but, um, you know, getting a little better day by day. So hopefully it stays on that trend, you know, down downhill. That's what yeah. you want. We, I love going downhill, so I... <laughs> <laughs> you can relate. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> um, how has it been, like, your experience, you know, being in New York during this time and being a doctor and kind of seeing everything firsthand? Uh, well, you know, I work, um, I'm based at Mount Sinai Medical School, which has kind of been in the heart of the epidemic. I have a lot of colleagues who have really been on the front lines in the thick of it. Um, and, you know, it's been a tough time. Um, but I'm, uh, although I've been fortunate, I've been working from home. Um, you know, I'm really proud of kind of my whole field and industry and my colleagues and what they've done and how they've really stepped up to the plate and the bravery. So um, obviously it's a hard time, but there are ways in which we can find inspiration in it all. So yeah. Uh, it's incredible what everyone's doing and it's hard to, you know, I think when you're not in the epicenter of everything, it's hard to kind of realize the magnitude of what's going on and how hard people are working to contain it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just good perspective to hear from you. Um, okay, so your research is like so in depth and complex, like I can't even fathom it. Um, can you explain in simple terms to some of our young kids watching what you do and like what's an average day look like for you? Um, not in quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is not the average day. Um, so I, I'm really interested in the physical brain and how it works but how it also relates to our minds because the brain is responsible to ep for everything that we think, that we feel, every emotion we have, all of our behavior, it's all related to this physical piece of matter. So what I'm really trying to understand is the connections between you know, how the neurons firing and the neurochemicals slushing around, how that actually creates our subjective experience, our mind, you know, who we are, everything we are, it's all coded in the brain. So I'm trying to make that connection between how the brain works and how that relates to how we think and feel. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can do that in a number of ways. Some of it is doing research. And what I found is that we can figure out how the brain works when it's broken. So like when your car is running perfectly, you kind of aren't aware of the workings of it. But when something is broken, you kind of have to go in and, and understand the mechanics to, to fix it. So we can understand how the brain works by looking at it when it's broken to see which parts kind of aren't working properly. And that's what I do. I look at people with certain mental disorders or neurological disorders to try to make a connection between the brain again and our thoughts. And then I try to come up with novel treatments to help these people. Um, and I also see patients individually for treatment as well. So I do things like talk therapy um, and other novel kinds of treatment with um, pharmacological treatments that we test. So it's a mixture of testing, treatment, and also a lot of writing, writing papers, writing grants, just writing, writing, writing. Yeah. yeah. A lot. Do you, have you, come, have you uh, written any books? I'm working on my first book now. Nice. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, with Simon & Schuster, and it's on, it's gonna, on impulse control and the brain. Um, so how to control our impulses, when is it good to rein them in? When is it good to actually let go? When is that therapeutic to kind of like go into these flow states? And when is it good control? to not eat Ben and Jerry's? That's right. <laughs> I need to control that impulse hundred percent. Right. 
It's all about moderation, <laughs> mindfulness. Um, but I think it's about everyone, you know, from every day, not eating too much Ben and Jerry's to people who have the extremes, you know, with like pathological gambling or um, other impulsive and compulsive behaviors that are um, destroying their lives. So it can go to that extreme measure just to like the everyday person wanting to go on a diet. What about like adrenaline and yes. being addicted to adrenaline? That is, you know, yeah. Oh yeah. You're exactly extreme sport. Um you know, we find actually that people who like these sort of, um, who are like sensation seekers actually at baseline have a lower level of um, dopamine and kind of the pleasure center of the brain. So it takes more for them to get the same level of pleasure that like something moderately dangerous might get another person. So you might be chronically slightly understimulated. So you need more just to get that same high. Um, as the average person would. So what can I do now that I don't have skiing, now that I'm retired, besides getting a lot of speeding tickets? All right. Well, that's one of the things. A lot of retired athletes get into trouble, right? Because now what used to be a healthy outlet for their sensation seeking is going into other places. So it's about finding things that are exciting, that give you that hit of dopamine um, that are positive. But so novel things, right? If you, if you, let's say, I don't know, always do crossword puzzles or something like do some other mental activity that's challenging because it's more about the challenge that brings about the excitement. So novelty um, and, and finding it in, in healthy outlets. I feel like I'm paying, I, th I feel like I'm getting a free session right now. So right. <laughs> don't worry, I'll send you the bill. At the right, no, I, I, it's awesome. I love it. But um, switching gears here, um, mm -hmm. just wondering, you know, cause you're a public figure in science. Has that given you like a new perspective on you know, science, your career, life, like what is it like being a public figure in science? You know, I really, it's twofold. One thing that I've always wanted, like when I grew up, um, and I, I imagine it might have been the same in your field as well, is like there weren't a lot of female role models, like neuroscientists or even scientists for that matter. Um, yeah. You know, I grew up with, who's a friend of mine now, Bill Nye, the science guy, who I love and he's great, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I love. But um, there weren't any like females like that to look up to. And I, I just, I'm glad to be out there showing like you can, you can, you don't have to be like super nerdy. You can be fun. You can, you can, you can dress cool. You could do it, you know, um, to break the stereotype of like what a scientist is. Um, so that's really enjoyable for me. And then also like, I love making the connection between my very like esoteric kind of like ivory tower world of academia. Um, where you write a paper and only a few people even understand it. Um, and being able to bring that to people and show them like why this science is so important to their everyday lives and get yeah. people excited about it, you know? And so that for me is so enjoyable. So it's less about like being a, a public figure and more about like, I get to have a platform to communicate um, this really cool science and get people excited about it. And like the best thing is if young people come up to me like, oh, I'm inspired to like go into science or to study the brain. And then I'm like, that's, you know, that's, that's awesome for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's perfect. And that's, that's really why we were doing this career day is just to kind of get, you know, get these strong, powerful female figures in front of them and see that they're tangible and real and, you know, give them something to look forward to and know that someone's done it before them. So Aww. we're just so happy to have you because it's so, it's so important for these girls to have you know, a strong, powerful female to look up to. And you're definitely that. So we appreciate okay. it. And now we're going to bring on our scholarship winner. She is a 2020 scholarship winner. She's going to the National Student Leadership Conference on Medicine and Healthcare. Um, she's 15 years old from Minnesota. Please welcome Gigi. Okay. Hi, Gigi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> How are you holding up in uh, quarantine? I'm um, good. I'm spending a lot more time with the family, so it's good. Um, yeah, and online school is pretty good, too. That's awesome. We have uh, Dr. Heather Berlin here. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Gigi, do you have any questions for Heather? You know, how do you, cause you want to be, um, in healthcare and science, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm very passionate about 
medicine. And um, actually, I haven't decided exactly what field, but um, I think it would be really great to hear from Dr. Berlin. <laughs> so I have some questions that I prepared. Um, my first question was, what guided her or what guided you, Dr. Berlin, to your decision to become a neuroscientist as opposed to other studies in medicine? Mm. Uh, so I was passionate about trying to figure out how the brain, the physical brain relates to the mind, right? And I, all the other parts of the body, like the digestive system or, um, you know, the reproductive system, the immune system, they're all obviously very important, but in terms of who we are, our identity, that all comes down to the brain. And the biggest question is how does the brain encode that? You know, how does it encode all of our thoughts and our feelings um, and our sense of identity? And we still don't fully understand that, you know, mapping out, correlating the physical brain and to the mind. And so that is what I became passionate about. And to help people who have either mental disorders or neurological illnesses that really affect who they are as a person. You know, it's beyond just having pain or a problem with your digestive system. It's really who you are. Yeah, that's, that, that's very true. Um, I guess my next question then would be, were there any difficulties that you faced as you were um, on your journey to becoming a neuroscientist and where you are now? <sighs> yes, <laughs> um, there were. Um, you know, one of them was um, because I was female, well, I am still actually, um, I, <laughs> you know, there was definitely lower expectations. Um, I, you know, would have to feel, felt like I had to work even harder to kind of prove myself. Um, and until I got to a point where I had enough confidence that I, you know, I knew I knew what I was doing. I knew that I would be good. And then I started to play with those expectations because I saw it as an asset. Like if they had lower expectations, then I could just really blow them away. And, um, you know, it was an advantage actually. I remember even when I was a graduate student, I used to purposely like not wear makeup, dress down, try to look really kind of shabby because I thought then they would take me more seriously. And then I got to a point like, no, I'm going to be who I am. Like, if, you know, I can, if I want to dress girly and, you know, wear frilly things, great. doesn't matter because I'll still blow them away with what, you know, with my mind. And so it's, it's getting to that point where you get that confidence. And the other thing is just, you know, keep going. If you're really passionate about something, you just keep at it and keep at it and don't let the obstacles um, push you back. Never tell yourself no, you just keep going. That's great. Thanks. That's Yeah, I would really take that to heart because I mean, I still think like girls are just not really, I feel like expected to pursue like STEM in that kind, like in a professional type of way. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, we got to um, knock, knock that stereotype out of the yeah. park. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, what do you think is your favorite part of uh, being a neuroscientist and like the, your favorite part of your job and your just day-to-day -day work, I guess? Uh, I mean, some of it is just so, so cool. Like I get the privilege of, for example, I get to on some days be in the operating room when people are undergoing brain surgery. Um, and what's amazing is that in some cases, they actually wake the person up during surgery. They can't feel anything. Cause actually your brain, even though it's the center of all your pain, the brain itself can't feel any pain. So like basically when you do surgery, you have to numb the scalp, right? Cause that feels pain to cut it open. And then they put you out when they drill through the skull minor thing and then but then when you're actually in the brain you you person can't feel anything and so sometimes let's say they're doing surgery to remove a tumor and you want to make sure for example you don't cut out the person's language area right because then they won't be able to talk anymore so what you do is you take a little electrode and you stimulate piece by piece and have them talk and talk and talk until you hit a piece where suddenly they can't talk anymore and you realize okay that's the part of the brain that has language 
don't touch that part. Make sure when you're cutting out the tumor to stay away from that part. And so that's why we'll wake up a patient during surgery to kind of do this cortical mapping, we call it, or brain mapping. But I mean, to be able to see that in, in real life and be a part of that, it's like such a privilege. It's amazing to be inside a living person's brain you know, and stimulating it and see how it affects them. So that's one of the coolest parts of my job. Um, the other rewarding thing is just when I do treatment of patients and they actually get better, you know, their anxiety do- goes down, their depression gets better. Like that's hugely um, rewarding as well. That's awesome. Wow, that, that does sound amazing. Um, well, I guess, okay, another question I have is, what are some misconceptions that people have about neuroscience or being a neuroscientist? Um, misconceptions. The biggest one that really bothers me is when people are like, oh, you only use 10% of your brain. Like, what if you used all of it? You know, <laughs> and like, that's just not true. We use all of our brain all the time. Like none of it is redundant. We just use it in different ways. Um, and so that's one of the big biggest misconceptions. Um, and then also just that, what we perceive, like all of our senses, right, are getting these signals and we create this image of the world in our minds, I, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with reality. It's, it's a sort of the brain is putting these little signals together and creating an image. Um, but we all see the world in slightly different ways. And so, you know, it's important to remember that we all have different perspectives. There's no like one true, um, there's sort of physical realities, but the way we perceive it varies um, because we're interpreting it through this piece of matter. So I just think that's really interesting. People think everything they perceive is the way it is and that's it, but we can be fooled. You know, we have these illusions all the time. Um, And I think that's something that people should be aware of and think about. Yeah. Well, I never thought about that before. (laughs) That's really interesting. Um, well, I guess my next question is, what is, or what do you feel is the biggest breakthrough of your career and of the work that you've done? One of the breakthroughs that I think it's, that's helped with, I think just the perspective of the entire field is working in this interdisciplinary way. So trying to bring like cut across fields of neurology and psychiatry and psychology and do research that integrates these fields. Um, so I think that just that kind of perspective is something that, you know, I wouldn't call it like a huge breakthrough, but, um, it's something that's really the way that the field has been evolving. When I was first coming up, when I was your age, there really wasn't even a field of cognitive neuroscience, like where you combine the brain and the mind, they were in these separate categories. Um, and I wanted to see how they were integrated. And so working, um, kind of where they come together has been something that's, I think, seminal into my career. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's like amazing to hear because I'm really interested in that and how like all these different fields of medicine can come together and just um, can be used in like ways that I think we don't even know yet. Like you were saying neuroscience wasn't really big when you were growing up. And yeah, so that's really, that's really cool to hear. Um, what's the most interesting thing to you like about science and and medicine and healthcare? Um, I would say the most interesting thing, I think Dr. Rillen talked about it a little bit, but um like just thinking about how how we work as like humans and it's just crazy to think like every every year like there's new discoveries that are coming out about medicine and about science, but Um, just completely change our world and completely change our understanding of the world we live in and of ourselves as well. So I think that's really like the biggest thing that um, interests me about both medicine and science is how they both um, completely change the way we view the world and ourselves. So So what do you want to be when you grow up, Gigi? Um, Well, I haven't really decided yet, but... um, kind of how Dr. Villain was talking about, I really want to go into a field where I can um, cross paths with um, more than just one field of medicine. So like, for example, like biotechnology or um, something that takes both medicine and science to um, evolve into 
creating maybe new biotechnology or creating something um, or discovering something that can help evolve the world and that can help us um, grow and help people. I think that's um, definitely something that I want to do, that I want to look into. Are you sure you're 15? (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, my birthday is uh, this Friday, so I'll be 16. Oh, happy (laughs) early birthday! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're so mature for your age. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Okay, I have one more question. I think Dr. Villain already talked about this, but um, I'll just ask again. What do you feel is like the, the most rewarding part of your job and um, of neuroscience, just like as a study itself? Yeah. Um, I, you know, yeah, I think that Being able to um, understand how the human brain works is like, for me, the most interesting thing, like there's two big questions, like, you know, the universe, right? Like, why are we here? How did we get here? You know, that's one big question. And I really think the other big question and still a mystery is um, how does the physical brain create who we are? And it's, you know, one of the most rewarding things is to help people, right? If you help people, they say that the most of any illness, the most suffering um, is caused by mental illness because even with other things like cancer and, you know, people suffer, but either they recover or unfortunately they pass away. But the like living with suffering, um, mental health is the biggest um sort of the the most uh, that causes the most suffering so if you can help relieve that kind of mental suffering it's it's worse than physical pain right um and when i can do that whether it's via um a discovery in research or just at the individual level with an individual patient um that's the most rewarding thing for me that's amazing great question very good questions (laughs) All right, so we're going to transition. We're going to play a, a game called Neuro Mythbusters. So it's true or false. Gigi and Dr. Berlin, you guys are kind of going to pair up to see if you can answer these questions. Okay. okay. Or just true or false, and maybe Dr. Berlin can elaborate. So first one, the brain is static and unchanging. Okay, I think it's false. <laughs> You are correct. correct. (laughs) You are correct. The brain is always changing. It is not static. Um, It's you know you can take a picture of it of it at one moment and then it's different. You know the way that it's functioning the next moment. The anatomy um, is relatively stable, but it can change throughout. You know as your brain is growing and evolving, it's never static and it's always changing. Nice, good one, Gigi. You got that one right. All right, listening to Mozart increases brain function. I think that's true or false. I think that's false also. (laughs) You're correct. Um, But that's a controversial one. That's a controversial one because there was this whole um, theory that like if you play Mozart, it'll make you smarter. It'll help you, you know, your brain. What is true is that music, certain types of music can help your brain. Um, particularly when you're doing a task that requires, that doesn't require a huge amount of mental energy. I once did a study actually with music and found that if it was a simple task, like, you know, um, writing as many words as you can to start with the letter S, um, having music there will help you go faster. It helps with productivity. But as the task became more difficult, mentally challenging, um, it was better to have no music on. So um, music can be energizing and stimulating, like it's good for working out and it might be good for certain mental tasks, but as you need more and more focus and concentration, it can become distracting. So um, that is a myth. Although Mozart is nice. (laughs) (laughs) I agree with that because I always listen to, I always listen to music when I work out, but I find that when I'm actually skiing, like competing, I can't listen to music because it's way too distracting. So very interesting. Okay, next question. Some people are left-brained and some people are right-brained. Hmm. Uh, I think that's also false. I'm not really sure about left-brained and right-brained. Uh, Correct again. Wow. Yes. Um, I thought that so was. I thought that was true. This is one of the biggest myths. Um, so basically, there is 
what we call laterality, but basically that means that there are some differences between your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere. So left hemisphere on average tends to be more, um, having more language areas, um, right kind of more emotional areas, um, but they're, they're connected, they're integrated. And so when we look at something like um, I've been interested, for example, in creativity. So like, what's the neural basis of creativity? They used to be thought of like right brain people are more creative and left brain are more logical. That's out the window. It's really um, differences in the brain circuitry that involve both hemispheres. Um, and it's more to do with like the prefrontal cortex compared to the rest of the brain, um, not left versus right. And some people have language on both sides of the hemisphere, even though it's more likely to be on the left, you still have a little bit of language on the right as well. Um, and some people are completely equal on both sides. So I, all of that is a myth. Um, and if you are more creative, it's because of certain circuits in your brain, not because you're more right brains, let's say. Interesting. That's a good myth buster. I definitely thought that we're left and right brain, so. Yeah. That was a good that one, one for me. Easily fooled on that one. That's a, that one has only recently been, relatively recently been debunked. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so next question. Mental capacity is hereditary and cannot be changed by environment or experience. Ooh. I think that's definitely false. I think that's false. I feel like yes. that's supposed to. Mm -hmm. True. Now, while there are some things that um, are heritable, meaning that like a certain percentage of an ability can be related to genetics, for example, like musical ability, um, you know, you, you can be born with a certain predisposition towards something, or let's say mathematical ability or physical, um, you know, abilities, but that will only get you so far. And then it's really about your interaction with the environment, your practice. I mean, Lindsay, like someone like you who gets to the really high levels of, of, of a sport, um, you have certain physical endowments that you're born with, but then it's that combined with the practice yeah. and the feedback and the training. And then together you can get at the highest level. So okay. just, just practice alone wouldn't do it and just genetics alone wouldn't do it, but yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. When a brain region is damaged, other parts of the brain can take up its function. Mm, I think maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. It's 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 semi true. It's semi true. It depends. So this is a tricky one. It depends on which brain region it is. Some brain regions, you other parts of the brain can't take over that function. Like they're critical regions. So the you have like these evolutionarily older parts of the brain that are like in the middle of the brain. We call it your reptilian brain. And then you have the kind of cortex that surrounds the brain. And so if you have damage to the cortex, depending on the area and how big, how large the area of damage is, some parts of the brain can take over, right? That's what we do cognitive rehabilitation for. So it's like if you, if you hurt a physical body part, you can do some rehab. Like your knee injury, your knee might never be fully the same but maybe the muscles around it can make up for oh, yeah. it slightly, you know? So muscles that's- to Compensate, yeah. Exactly. So that's just like what it's like in the brain. Like it's not, you might not go back to how you were before fully if you have a brain injury, but some things around it can compensate. Um, but if you hit like a critical area, like a subcortical area, um, that you, you, know, you might not be able to compensate for that. So it depends on where the damage is, how big the area of damage is, um, and on whether your brain can compensate. So we have some neuroplasticity, but it can only go so far. Got it. That makes sense. Mm, yeah. All right. This is a good one. Female and male brains are radically different from each other. <laughs> oh, this is a hard one. Um, I want to say false. But it might be, yeah, yes, correct. <laughs> they are not radically different. Listen, there are, I mean, there are some differences on average between male and female brains, um, but they're not radical. You know, we um, men. So one thing, men's brains tend to be slightly larger, right? But it's not size that matters. It's connectivity that matters when it comes to say intelligence. It doesn't matter. It's not because or else like you know a whale brain is way bigger than ours, but they're not, you know, they can't do calculus. So it's not about the size, it's about connectivity, but the slight variations between men and women, some have to do with the way the brain forms because of hormones are involved and that affects some areas of brain development. But on average, they're not radically different. 
Hmm. I thought male brains were smaller. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, that's a funny. That's my funny joke. All right. Um. All right. Last one. This is also funny. Adults can't grow new brain cells. Um. I think it's false. I think they can. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. So this is a tricky one too, because technically like, okay, so we have like stem cells, stem cells are undifferentiated cells, which is like, they can grow into anything, right? They're different cell types. Yeah, in I body. use stem cells in my knees. Yeah. Oh, oh, so you had a knee thing. Okay. Yep. So you know all about them. The, the, oh, that's interesting. So they injected it with stem cells. Yeah. So they drill it from your, from your, uh, hip, from your like iliac crest, and then they, um, inject it into my knees. I spin it down and then inject it back into my knees. So that it would grow like the cartilage. And yeah, it would the, help grow the cartilage and like kind of uh, help heal the meniscus because I have like meniscal flaps. Wow, interesting. So there, so great example. Like they're basically like cells that can grow into any other kind of cells depending on what signals they get and where they're placed. So we have those in certain parts of our brain. So in what, some ways we're brain, we're born with, with many more connections in the brain than we need. And as we grow, we kind of get rid of the connections we don't need and we strengthen the ones we do. So actually the number of connections goes down as we age, as our brains become more efficient. Um, the number of cells don't change. It's more about the connections and the growths. However, we do have a storage of some stem cells in certain areas of the brain, like the hippocampus and the olfactory areas that, that can migrate out at any time in life. They can come out and then grow into neurons. Really? So, yeah, yeah. So even though we're kind of born with all the cells we'll have, there are some that kind of are in storage that if stimulated can come out. And, and How do I stimulate those? <laughs> um, mental activities, learning new things, challenging yourself, uh, those kinds of things that will, they, they can grow. You can, you can grow these brain cells. I definitely need to work on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's the, that's our little myth busters. Um, you got all the questions, questions, right? Gigi, you are <laughs> so impressive. We're so proud of you and so happy to have you, you as our scholarship winner is there any last questions you want to ask Dr. Berlin before we say goodbye? Um, I don't think so. She answered all my questions pretty well. Awesome. Um, yeah. I just want to say thank you. Um, I had a great time and I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Gigi. I love to You're you. the best. Yeah. Good luck, okay? Thank Can't you. Wait to see what you do in the future. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Gigi. Bye. <laughs> All right, guys, that was our latest edition of Career Day. We were so inspired by Dr. Berlin and, of course, our scholarship winner, Gigi. This is the kind of thing that we're really hoping to accomplish with Career Day, help inspire the next generation and do thing that, things that no one's done before. So thank you so much to both of our guests. Um, remember to click subscribe and also we have a charity component to all of our episodes. Um, this link today is going to be for first book donating 7 million books to children who don't have access to internet and who need to keep studying. So we're, we're happy to help them and we're, we hope that you guys were inspired by today's session. So keep staying positive, wish you guys all the best and we'll see you next week on career day.